Kyle is Mr. Yeager for Physical Science, and we are finishing up our unit on energy, work, and simple machines with simple machines. So what we're going to look at here is being able to identify what are simple machines in physics, in physical science, and um, basically the idea of what's their purpose, and then trying to calculate things like mechanical advantage and efficiency. Okay, so here we go. So. Simple machines, okay, what are they there for? Essentially, they're trying to help us make us do work easier, okay? Instead of having to do things with our hands all the time, is there a tool out there that we can use that can help us redirect the force to increase our force to make it easier for us to do that job? And again, these are not like super complicated things. These, these simple machines are what's in basically every single device, a more complicated machine, it's just each are then connected doing their specific purpose and their specific, uh, specific job to make work a whole lot easier, okay? So a simple machine basically does two things. I kind of said it already. It'll either increase the force that you apply or it'll change the direction of the force you apply. Now, I should add in there, it can also decrease the force that you apply because maybe you're using trying to manipulate cells and like working with very, very delicate objects, you might need to have something that can decrease the force that your fingers apply to use that object and manipulate it. So, but for our purpose for this, for in physical science, we're basically always going to say it's there to increase your force, okay, and change the direction of it. So just going over different types of simple machines for you, we're not going to be using all of these to really calculate uh, Things. We're going to use kind of the same two or three simple machines out there with certain calculations. But a wheel and axle is a simple machine. The purpose of a wheel and axle, the smaller axle rotates and one small rotation of an axle makes a larger wheel rotate all the way around. So one small rotation is, is increasing to a much larger rotation on a larger object. Okay. A pulley. A pulley is another simple machine. It helps redirect the direction of the force. It also helps you apply less force to lift that heavier object. Okay, so that's the idea of pulleys. We have an inclined plane. An inclined plane, just like a pulley, is helping you have to like it's making that work easier. You you are don't have to apply as much force to get that object up a hill, up a height into a truck, etc. This is versus you having to lift and carry that whole weight up. For this, you're only having to lift up a partial amount of the weight, technically. Okay. A wedge, axes, knives, doorsteps, things like that. These things help re uh, change the direction of the force. Okay. The idea here is a wedge, I mean, if you're trying to split the wood, you can try to grab the wood on both sides and pull. That's never going to work. Or you apply a force straight down with the wedge, but what does the wedge do? It creates a force to the sides once you create a force downward, okay? There's screws, okay? Screws are other types of simple machines. Again, doing a small change in distance while creating a larger change in distance around it, okay? That helps kind of keep the object in place. And then the last one I believe that we have is what we call a lever or a lever, okay? Again, where you are able to maybe lift a heavier object or move an, a heavier object based on how far you're pushing uh, on it and with having something called a fulcrum in the middle. Okay, that would be your lever. So seesaw, scissors, your elbow, they're all different types of levers or levers. Sorry, I'm gonna go back and forth. All right, so those are all your different types of simple machines. Okay, um, again, just being identified them as part of this. The thing is with the lever, the lever, we do want to actually break this one down a bit more. You might have to identify uh, a little bit more about le uh, levers. There are three parts to any lever. We have what are called the load force or what's sometimes called the resistance arm. These can sometimes have a couple different names. Resistance arm or load force. This is what you're trying to lift. We call it a resistance because the object is resisting the motion that you're trying to impart on it. We can also just call it a load force, okay? Uh, so again, that's what you're trying to lift. What's the load? So we have a load force, 
we have what's called an effort force. This is the force that you are applying. So the load force is what's trying to be lifted. Effort is what you are applying. And then what we have in the middle, well, not even in the middle, what we have to rotate it is what we call a fulcrum. So there's three parts to any lever, a load force, an effort force, and a fulcrum. Don't worry about resistance, arm, effort, I'm going to come back to that. Load force, effort force, fulcrum. Okay. The idea is, with a lever, you're not going to have to apply as much effort force to lift the larger load force based on it, the setup of the lever, where the fulcrum is. Okay. The fulcrum is your rotating point. So what we have is there's actually three types of levers, okay? Three classes of levers. And it's all based on where the fulcrum is, okay? Based on where the fulcrum is in relation to the effort and the load force. It's basically, now it says position of the fulcrum. <coughs> I like to look at it as what's in the middle, okay? What of these three things is in the middle? When I switch out load force and the fulcrum and move the load force to the middle, that is creating a different type of lever. So the type of lever that you probably all know is the first class lever. This is the one, this is your seesaw, okay? Most people don't mess this one up. The, C, the first class lever, you have the fulcrum in the middle, okay? The fulcrum's in the middle. It says lever in the middle. I should say fulcrum's in the middle, okay? The fulcrum's in the middle. So examples of first class levers, seesaws and scissors, all right? Because you are applying, the, the effort and the load are on completely op excuse me, opposite sides with the fulcrum in the middle. Again, there's other ones, okay? Uh, your elbow, your elbow is a uh, first class lever, okay? Because the idea is your effort is, the, is your muscle, your bicep, and then what's in your hand that you're lifting would be the load, okay? And your elbow itself would be the lever. So seesaw, scissors, elbows, there are first class levers. There's plenty more out there that you're going to maybe have to identify. A second class lever, let's separate these out, kind of focus on it. A second class lever is where the load is in the middle. The load is in the middle. What you're lifting is in the middle, and the fulcrum and the effort are on opposite sides. There's not too many of these out here. Basically, the, the only two I can think of most of the time with this is a wheelbarrow. Okay, a wheelbarrow is definitely a second class lever. You can see the fulcrum would be the wheel at the bottom. What you're loading is in the middle and you're lifting at the end here. So the load's in the middle, okay, between you and the fulcrum. Anything you're towing, okay, like if you have a car that you're towing, that would be also a second class lever. So a tow truck where it's towing a car, that becomes a second class lever. Okay, because the car is what's pulling it down, the wheels are help rotating, the fulcrum basically, where you can lift it and angle it, and then the effort is the toe itself holding it up in the air. Third class lever, you have the effort in the middle. And examples would be a hammer and a bat. Basically, anything that you swing, all right, almost anything that you swing is gonna be a third class lever, okay? But the effort is in the middle. The effort's in the middle, okay? Uh, a common example would be a broom, okay? A broom would be a, a third class lever. The idea is you're holding the broom at the top, okay? You're pushing in the middle. The resistance is down on the ground. That's what's resisting the motion. You're pushing it in the middle, and basically your top hand is a lever that's just rotating back and forth. Same thing goes with a bat. Basically, your wrist is the fulcrum. Your, other, your top hand is essentially the effort going through. And then obviously the resistance would be what you're about to hit. Okay? So that's the nice thing with third class levers is, I mean, while yes, they are confusing to try to keep track of, for me, I usually just use one object to try to like relate to each one. First class seesaws, okay? And again, that's one that I feel like is just the most, it seems the most common. Ends up, I feel like third class is very, very common. All right? But that's one that I think most people kind of remember. It's second and third that people mess up. If you can remember third class as things that you swing, I think you're going to be able to handle these just fine. Okay? Third class lever is things that you swing. 
All right, so here's just other pictures of it, okay? Uh, I mean, we could try to basically figure out each of these. It doesn't actually have them listed right here. I mean, it's all essentially correct with it, all right? But right here, we got our first class, oh, come on. We got our first class lever right here at the top. This is second class with your wheelbarrow. And then you have your third class lever down here, okay? Third class lever down there. I don't like that kind of crane example so much. I think that's a little bit confusing, but it is true. Again, it's rotating at the top, efforts in the middle, and your loads at the end. L E F. Okay, but that that's the way it goes with it. All right. Some other uh, well, no, we already kind of talked about these. Some terms we need to know. We've already kind of talked about this is we have what's called the effort force, which is going to be Fe. We already said that's the force that you apply to the machine. We have what's called effort distance, DE. Effort distance is the distance between your effort force and the fulcrum. Down here, they call it the effort arm. Okay, That's not a super common phrase anymore. We would just say it's the effort distance, the distance between your application of force and the fulcrum. Then we have what's called, uh, oh, sorry. With these two things together, we can create what's called the work input. Your effort force times the effort distance is equal to the work input into the machine itself. How much work you're applying, force times distance. Right? On the opposite side, what I was about to say, is we have what's called the resistance or load force. This is what you are lifting. It says the force applied by the machine. If that th it doesn't make sense, this is what you are lifting. Okay, the weight of the weight of what you are lifting. Okay, that is the resistance or load force. All right. Then we have what's called the resistance or load distance, just like the effort distance. This is where it's the distance between the resistance and the fulcrum. Okay, so we have two forces and two distances. We have effort force, what you are applying, load force, what you're trying to lift. You got effort distance, the distance between your effort and the fulcrum, load distance between the load and the fulcrum. If I multiply these two together, the load force and the load distance, it's equal to the work output. Okay, it's telling you how much work you're getting out of the machine. So the effort is what you're putting in, what you're trying to lift is what's coming out, okay? And that's important because that's gonna help us with a different formula. So that's what we're getting to. How effective is the machine then? How do I know how good the machine is? We have something called mechanical advantage. Mechanical advantage is simply a number. It's the number of times the machine increases your effort force. The number of times that it has no units. Okay? But what it's saying is just how many times better is it doing your job than you? That's another way to kind of think of it. Is it doubling your, your uh, basically your output? Okay? What is it trying to do for you? All right? Is it doubling your force that you put in? That's what we're looking at. Okay? So mechanical advantage, there's a couple ways to calculate it. Mechanical advantage, MA. One way to calculate it is it's the resistance force divided by the effort force. All right, the load divided by your effort, okay? Another way we can do it is based on the distances. That's why we did, we showed both. Now this is confusing to a lot of people because you can see for one, for force, it's resistance over effort. When we're doing mechanical advantage using forces, it's resistance over effort. But if I look at the distances, I have to reverse them. It's the effort distance divided by the resistance distance. All right? But that's why we need to know what is the force and what's the distance of that force from the fulcrum, because both of them can be used to help us solve for the final answer. Okay? So one way of mechanical advantage is resistance force over effort force. Another way, effort distance over resistance distance. All right? The greater the mechanical advantage, the easier the job is on you. The machine is multiplying your effort force. There's no units for mechanical advantage. It's just a number. All right. 
As a quick side note down here, you can see the double stars down here. Okay. If it ever asks you to find the mechanical advantage of a pulley, okay, pulley with the wheels, you just count up how many wheels are in the pulley. That's it. That's it. You don't have to do any calculation. The number of circles in the pulley, that is the mechanical advantage of the pulley. Okay. So if we do an example to figure out mechanical advantage, you apply 50 newtons of force to a machine. The machine then produces 250 newtons of force to the ground. What is the mechanical advantage of the machine? All right. So again, tough thing here. We have to figure out which is which. You are applying 50 newtons, so that's your effort force, 50 newtons. Resistance, what you're lifting, what's pushing back against you, is 250 newtons. So we have to identify which one is which and then divide. Resistance force divided by effort force, 250 divided by 50. This machine has a mechanical advantage of five. What does that mean? It's always gonna multiply what you put in by five. All right, that's what we're looking at. Efficiency. Efficiency is looking at how well the machine does the job. Okay, it's a percent. It's saying how, and how good, how much energy is it possibly losing, okay? Is it using all the energy you put into it or is there some energy loss? That's efficiency. Obviously, it has to be a below 100%. There's always friction out there, so friction always will reduce any, the effectiveness of any machine. Energy will always be lost. So efficiency for most machines is actually down at like 20%. It's like super low, okay, in real life. We're going to do problems where we're going to have these very highly efficient machines. If you're able to make a highly efficient machine, like even 50%, you can make a lot of money. So good luck. Efficiency. Efficiency is equal to the output work divided by the input work, all multiplied by 100. Output divided by input times 100. So what you might have is something like this. You put 1,000 joules of work into a machine, but the machine only produces 750 joules of work. All right. It might multiply your force. It is changing your force. It is improving the amount of force being done. But in so doing, there is friction involved and things are lost. All right? It's not producing the same amount of energy that you put in. So how would I do this? Work output divided by work input times 100. 750 divided by 1,000 times 100. That would be 0.75 times 100. This machine would be 75% efficient. All right. Again, just to point it out, this right here is your work input. So this is equal to your force input times the distance. Uh, uh, yeah, the input distance. Okay, the input distance. Okay, uh, sorry, the effort force. I'm using the wrong word. Work input is your effort force times your uh, effort distance. So this was somehow calculated by multiplying these two things together. This right here, work output, is equal to the, for the resistance force times the resistance distance. All right. While this resistance force might be larger than the effort distance, the effort, oh man, sorry, I'm talking wrong here. Because the resistance force, I mean, it's possible, the resi hopefully, the resistance force is larger than the effort, di effort force, I keep on wanting to say distance, the distance, the the resistance distance might might be much much less than their effort distance, and therefore that's why the work might not be the same, or why you might have less work as well. Okay, but that's efficiency. Work output divided by work input times a hundred. That's what we're looking at for. Last thing to note. You might be hearing about compound machines. Compound machines is where basically now you put all these different simple machines together. A car, obviously, uh, right there, that's my car. It's not, that'd be awesome. All right. Um, that has obviously multiple simple machines in it. There's pulleys, there's wheels and axles. Um, I'm sure there's levers. I mean, there's all sorts of things in that machine right there. That's how all machines are. All right. And again, when I put multiple simple machines together, it's called a compound machine. We don't have to do anything else other than know the term compound machine. But that's it. Thank you.